It's always a pleasure having you on Africa 24. We are here in Marrakesh, Morocco, on the occasion of the 14th U.S.-Africa Business Summit. Today we'll be receiving on set Mr. Curtis Lockhart. He's the Executive Director of Charter Cities Institute. Mr. Lockhart will be talking to us about the work Charter, Institute is do Charter Cities Institute is doing to boost investment opportunities between the U.S. and African countries. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Lockhart. Thanks so much, Mildred. Pleasure to be here. So you are the Executive Director of Charter Cities Institute. Can you tell us about the mission and the objective of this institution? Of course, yeah. So Charter Cities Institute, or CCI, we are a think tank. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C. We also have offices in Lusaka, Zambia, and are working all over the continent. Uh, what we're really about is empowering new cities with better governance to lift tens of millions of people out of poverty. And we want to do that through building new charter cities. And so just to back up a bit, some of your audience members might be wondering, you know, what's a charter city? Uh, so a charter city is just the next generation of special economic zones or SEZs on steroids, you could say. Um, so what does that mean? They're like SEZs, but they have uh, city, city scale, urban residents, and they have greater devolved authority to set new rules within the city jurisdiction that allows them to create a better business environment. And we think this can be a transformative way to attract investment, to spur business formation and job creation, to cluster innovation and good governance. And with all these things, they can help kickstart economic growth in that city and help folks lift themselves out of poverty into prosperity. So you are taking part in the 14th U.S.-Africa Business Summit. Can you just give us your views and your general impression about this summit that comes at a time when African countries and countries in the world are struggling to make their way out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine? Absolutely. This week has been fantastic. It's always a pleasure when different stakeholders involved in development and pushing people into prosperity get together and are convened around one table to solve the toughest problems of the day. One of them, of course, being the one you mentioned, COVID-19, but there's so many more. We're focused, obviously, on cities. There's a massive, massive infrastructure deficit that's going to take trillions of dollars per year in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. There's the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. All of these huge global problems uh, were on the table this week, and they had the right players in the room to come to commitments to action. And that's what I think the buzzword should be around the com uh, conference is folks were committed to actually leaving the conference, making deals and performing actions rather than the common rhetoric and talk we get at conferences uh, without any follow through after the conference has come to a conclusion. So, so can you tell us more about those actions, the role and the contribution that Charter Cities Institute is doing in boosting trade and investment between the US and African countries? Yes, so we have several new city developments that we work with across the continent. As I mentioned, our office is in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, so we're working there with a new city development outside of the capital, Lusaka. Uh, we're also working with Malawi's secondary cities plan. That's eight secondary cities that are planned to be built across the country from north to south to really grapple with this huge problem of rapid urbanization. Malawi is actually one of the least urbanized countries on planet Earth. It's 17% urbanized. But over the next 28 years, Malawi is set to add uh, or triple its urban population. And so the government said, this is going to be a challenge. We need to deal with this. If we don't manage this rapid urbanization adequately, these cities are going to be centers of kind of congestion and crime and contagious disease that we've seen over the last two years. Or if we manage this properly, cities are centers of growth, engines of growth, centers of innovation and ideas, and they're where firms want to come and locate and transform raw products into uh, processed goods. And so we're working with uh, Malawi's National Planning Commission to do just that. We're also working with other new city developments in Nigeria. Uh, two come to mind there. One is around Talent City. So this is really centered around Nigeria's burgeoning tech ecosystem. The big constraint to that tech growth in Nigeria is around tech talent. And so Talent City is a, a city outside of Lagos that's meant to be a space where tech talent can be attracted, connected to tech jobs, and also has the digital infrastructure that's reliable uh, that you need to set up tech companies. The other uh, new city development in Nigeria is Inimba Economic City. 
it's in the southeast in Abia State and uh, that's the oil and gas sector in Nigeria so it'll be specialized at the beginning on processing and manufacturing oil and gas as well as logistics around those processes but for phase two and phase three Animba wants to bring in the social infrastructure including a world-class hospital and research institution and a university so a fully fledged mixed-use city first centered around ONG but then diversifying thereafter so that's just a few of the new city projects we're working with across the continent and after the summit this week we'll be involved in many more. So the summit is all about boosting public and private partnership at a time when they are trying to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine. So can you tell us how platforms such as the US Africa Business Summit can help them come, out, come up the, challenge, the challenges they are facing? So what I really took from the summit is it has been an extremely valuable venue to meet with the necessary folks, both on the US side, which can often bring the financing and the upfront capital, and the African side, which brings the projects and the things that need to get built and done. And when you bring them both together, you can make some magic happen. And that's really what we're trying to do with new city developments. We've talked with both entities from the U.S. government, including uh, Prosper Africa, the entities under Prosper Africa include the New Development Finance Corporation, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, USTDA, U.S. Trade and Development Agency. We've talked with all of these entities, Commerce, uh, the Exim Bank. And then on the flip side, while Prosper Africa can connect uh, these projects across Africa with, with much needed capital, um, the African governments are the ones that say, here are our priorities where does your capital, the U.S. government, fit into those priorities and how can we make deals and come out of this summit you know, at a better place with those deals than we were before. So you're absolutely right that public-private partnerships are going to be the cornerstone of uh, a lot of deals, including these new city developments uh, that will involve both local urban developers here in Africa across the continent, um, partnering with host country uh, governments as well as getting these DFIs involved from Prosper Africa and other DFIs across the, across the world. So tell us, Mr. Lockhart, after this summit, where, what key sectors in Africa should we see U.S. investments coming from after this summit? U.S. aid and investment historically has been skewed rural. It's been skewed towards kind of agricultural transformation and other things in the rural sector. This is outdated. Africa's future is an urban future, and it's increasingly urban. Over the course of this century, uh, Africa is going to see one billion new urban residents in their cities. This is unprecedented in scale and scope. And so what the U.S. government needs to do is see that megatrend, this demographic shift towards the city, and readjust and reallocate its aid and investment accordingly. I'm a cities guy, but you look at the trends and they're undeniable. So that's, that's the main thing that I think needs to be incorporated from this summit as far as the U.S. government is concerned, is readjusting, reallocating some of their aid and investment flows towards cities to better manage this really, really, really rapid urbanization process that's going to unfold across this century. How can we benefit from platforms such as the U.S.-Africa Business Summit so as to guarantee a win-win partnership between both parties? so that we don't just see one person winning, but we see both parties going along. Yeah, and I think this is the true virtue of public-private partnerships, is you don't enter into one unless all stakeholders in that PPP see value out of that partnership. One of the things that in our conversations has come up repeatedly with projects is that it's really difficult to get a project to bankability. In emerging market settings, there's a lot of resources and a lot of time that go into due diligence work and feasibility studies that are things that need to be carried out before finance is agreed to, right, before bankability. And these feasibility studies and due diligence take a ton of upfront capital without getting any revenue in return. And so what I've liked here at the summit this week is seeing all the opportunities for these project preparation facilities that fund and help get projects towards bankability by making it easier and providing capital for that initial due diligence work and feasibility studies. So that's one of my big takeaways. And I think by doing that, you push more nascent projects 
towards uh, bankability, and that's what you want because the banks are saying, the financial institutions are saying that the big challenge for them is a lack of a pipeline of bankable projects in the first place. So the more we can get through this initial valley of death that involves all this due diligence work, I think the better. So tell us, Mr. Lockhart, how specifically can Charter Cities Institute help African countries meet the challenges they are facing in terms of energy, infrastructure, trade finance? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, Africa's future is urban. Uh, one billion new city residents over the span of 28 years, right? That's less than three decades. This is unprecedented scale, scope, and speed. The only other time in history that we've seen close to this one billion number is China. After 1978, uh, China added 700 million people from countryside to city. Uh, to 2010, 700 million Chinese migrated to cities. And they did so really effectively. This is what helped drive Chinese growth over the last four or five decades. How did they do that? China did it through a combination of two things. One is that rapid urbanization, 700 million people. The other is special economic zones. So they set up four special economic zones in the south of China. One of them was Shenzhen SEZ that has been one of the most astounding developments on planet Earth, Earth over the last four decades. It evolved from a agglomeration of fishing villages in 1980 to a metropolitan global city of over 20 million people today. It is the third largest city economy in China after Beijing and Shanghai. Astounding growth in a short amount of time. And what did, uh, what did Shenzhen do? They did two things. They devolved uh, authority down, to, down from Beijing and the CCP to local officials in Shenzhen uh, that allowed those officials to scramble and innovate and experiment in new policies to make a more conducive business environment. And second, they allowed for more liberalized business regulations and more liberalized commercial law within the jurisdiction of Shenzhen. So this is why I say you can think of Shenzhen as a proto-charter city and we want to take inspiration from this model of special economic zones in China and basically create special economic cities that have this special jurisdiction that make it more easy and conducive to operate a business, register a business in these cities such that it attracts investment and spurs business formation. That's, uh, that's the goal of charter cities across the continent. All right, thank you so much, sir, for being a part of us. Yeah, thanks so much, Mildred. This was thank fun. You so much. Pleasure. And that was it for this interview. Thank you for watching. We have more news coming up on Africa 24.